Hey everyone, it's Corey HS, the recruitment specialist with Girl Scouts of Southwest Texas. Once again, welcoming you to another episode of our Girl Scout Virtual Book Club. Today we are going to get into our part two of James and the Giant Peach. So we will be reading a few more chapters of this book and then we have two discussion questions and then an activity challenge. So let's go in, let's get started. Chapter 11. James's large frightened eyes traveled slowly around the room. The creatures sitting on chairs, others reclining on the sofa, were all watching him intently. Creatures or were they insects? An insect is usually something rather small, is it not? A grasshopper, for example, is an insect. So what would you call it if you saw a grasshopper as large as a dog, as large as a large dog? You could hardly call that an insect, could you? There was an old green grasshopper as large as a large dog sitting in a stool directly across the room from James now. And next to the old green grasshopper, there was an enormous spider. The next to the spider, there was a giant ladybug with nine black spots on her scarlet shell. Each of these were three were squatting upon a magnificent chair. One on a sofa nearby, reclining comfortably in a curled up position, there was a centipede and an earthworm. On the floor over in the far corner, there was something thick and white that looked as though it might be a silkworm, but it was sleeping soundly and nobody paid much attention to it. Every one of these creatures was at least as big as James himself, and in the strange greenish light that shone down from somewhere in the ceiling, they were absolutely terrifying to behold. I'm hungry, the spider announced suddenly, staring at James. I'm famished, the old green grasshopper said. So am I, the ladybug cried. A centipede sat up in the little straighter in the sofa. Everyone's famished, she said. We need food. Four pairs of round black glassy eyes were all fixed upon James. The centipede made a wriggling movement with his body as though he were about to glide off the sofa, but he didn't. There was a long pause and a long silence. The spider, who had happened to be a female spider, opened her mouth and ran a long black tongue delicately over her lips. Aren't you hungry? She asked suddenly, leaning forward and addressing herself to James. Poor James was backed up against a wall of the far wall, shivering with fright and much too terrified to answer. What's the matter with you? The old green grasshopper asked. You look positively ill. He looks as though he's going to faint at any second, said the centipede. Oh my goodness, the poor thing, the ladybug cried. I do believe he thinks it's him that we're wanting to eat. There was a roar of laughter from all sides. Oh dear, oh dear, they said. What an awful thought. You must have been frightened, the ladybug said kindly. We wouldn't dream of hurting you. You're the one of us now. Didn't you know that? You're one of the crew. We're all in the same boat. We have been waiting for you all day long, the old green grasshopper said. We thought you were never going to turn up, but I'm glad you made it. So cheer up, my boy. Cheer up, the centipede said. And meanwhile... I wish that you'd come over here and give me a hand with these boots. It takes me hours to get all of them off by myself. James decided that this was the most certainly not a time to be disagreeable. So he crossed the room where the centipede was sitting and knelt down beside him. Thank you so much, centipede said. You are very kind. You have a lot of boots, James murmured. I have a lot of legs, the centipede answered proudly, and a lot of feet, 100 to be exact. There he goes again, the earthworm cried, speaking for the first time. He simply cannot stop telling lies about his legs. He doesn't have anything like a hundred of them. He's only got 42. The trouble is that most people don't bother to count them. They just take his word. And anyway, there is nothing marvelous, you know, centipede, about having a lot of legs. Poor fellow, said the centipede, whispering into James' ear. He's blind. He can't see how splendid I look. In my opinion, the earthworm said, the really marvelous thing is to have no legs at all and be able to walk just the same. You call that walking, cried the centipede. You're a slitherer. That's all you are. You just slither along. I glide, the earthworm said primly. You are a slimy beast, answered the centipede. I am not a slimy beast, the earthworm said. I am a useful and much loved creature. Ask any gardener you like. As, and as for you, I am a pest, the centipede announced, grinning broadly and looking around the room for approval. He is so proud of that, the ladybug said, smiling at James. Though, for the life of me, I cannot understand why. I am the only pest in this room, cried the centipede, grinning away, unless you count the old green grasshopper over there, but he is long past it now. He is too old to be a pest anymore. The old green grasshopper turned his head, huge, eye, huge black eyes upon the centipede and gave him a withering look. Young fellow, he said, taking, speaking in a deep, low, scornful voice, I have never been a pest in my life. I am a musician. Here, here, said the ladybug. James, the centipede said, your name is James, isn't it? Yes. Well, James, have you ever in your life seen such a marvelous colossal centipede as me? 
I certainly haven't, James answered. How on earth did you get to be like that? Very peculiar, the centipede said. Very, very peculiar indeed. Let me tell you what happened. I was messing about in the garden under the old peach and suddenly a funny little thing came wriggling past my nose. Bright green it was and extraordinarily beautiful and it looked like some kind of tiny stone or crystal. Oh, but I know what that was, cried James. It happened to me too, said the ladybug. And me, Miss Spider said. Suddenly there were little green things everywhere. The soil was full of them. I actually swallowed one, the earthworm declared proudly. So did I, said the ladybug. I swallowed three, said the, the centipede cried. But who's telling the story anyway? Don't interrupt. It's too late to tell stories now, the old green grasshopper announced. It's time to go to sleep. I refuse to sleep in my boots, the centipede cried. How many more are there to come off, James? I think I've done about 20 so far, James told him. That leaves 80 to go, the centipede said. 22, not 80, shrieked the earthworm. He's lying again. The centipede roared with laughter. Stop pulling the earthworm's legs, the ladybug said. The centipede, this sent the centipede in hysterics. Pulling his leg, he cried, wriggling in glee and pointing at the earthworm. Which leg am I pulling? You tell me that. James decided that he'd rather like the centipede. He was obviously a rascal, but what, what changed? But what a change it was to hear somebody laughing once in a while. He had never heard Aunt Sponge or Aunt Spiker laughing around all aloud in all the time he had been with them. We really must get some sleep, the old grasshopper said. We've got a tough day ahead of us tomorrow, so would you be kind enough, Miss Spider, to make the beds? A few minutes later, Miss Spider had made up the first bed. It was hanging from the ceiling, suspended by a rope of threads, either either end so that it actually looked more like a hammock than a bed. It, but it was a magnificent affair. The stuff that it was made of shimmered like silk in the pale light. I do hope that you'll find it comfortable, Miss Spider said to the old green grasshopper. I made it soft and silky as I possibly could. I spun it with gossamer. That's a much better quality thread than the one I use for my own web. Thank you so much, my dear lady, the old grass green grasshopper said, climbing into the hammock and, ah, this is just what I needed. Good night, everybody, good night. Then the spider spun the next hammock and the ladybug got in. After that, he, she spun a long one for the centipede and an even longer one for the earthworm. And how did you like your beds? She asked. She said to James when it came to his turn, hard or soft? I like it soft, thank you very much, James answered. For goodness sake, stop staring around the room and get on with my boots, the centipede said. You and I are never going to get any sleep at this rate. And kindly line them up and neatly pairs as you take them off. Don't just throw them over your shoulder. James worked away frantically and this on the centipede's boots. Each one of them, each one had laces that had to be untied and loosened before it could be pulled off. To make matters worse, all the laces were tied up in the ghost, in the most complicated knots that had to be unpicked with fingernails. It was just awful. It took about two hours, and by the time James had pulled off the last boot, all of the boot of all, and had lined them up into the row on the on the floor, twenty-one pairs altogether. The centipede was fast asleep. Wake up, centipede! Whispered James, giving him a, a gentle dig in the stomach. It's time for bed. Thank you, my dear child, the centipede said, moving his eyes. Then he got down off the sofa and ambled across the room and crawled into his hammock. James got into his own hammock, and oh, how soft and comfortable it had compared with the hard, bare boards that his aunts had always made him sleep upon at home. Lights out, said the centipede drowsily. Nothing happened. Turn out that light, he called, raising his voice. James glanced around the room, wondering which of the others he might be talking to, but they were all asleep. The old green grasshopper was snoring loudly through his nose, and the ladybug was making whistling noises as she breathed, and the earthworm was coiled up like a spring at one end of the hammock, whizzing and blowing through his open mouth. As for Miss Spider, she had been made a lovely web for herself across the corner of the room, and James could see her crouching right in the, in the very center of it, mumbling softly in her dreams. I said, turn out the lights, shouted the centipede angrily. Are you talking to me? James asked. Of course not. I'm not talking to you, the centipede answered. That crazy glowworm has gone to sleep with her light on. For the first time since entering the room, James glanced to the ceiling, and there he saw a most extraordinary light, a, a most extraordinary sight. Something that looked like a gigantic fly without wings. It was at least three feet long, was standing upside down upon its six legs in the middle of the ceiling, and the tail end of its of the creature seemed to be literally on fire. A brilliant greenish light from the bright, as bright as the brightest electric bulb was shining out of his tail and the lighting up the whole room. Is that a glowworm? asked James, staring at the light. It doesn't look like a worm of any sort. Of course it's a glowworm, said Centipede answered. At least that's what she calls herself. Although actually, well, you are quite right. She really, she isn't really a glowworm at all. Glowworms are never worms. They are simply lady fireflies without wings. Wake up, you lazy beast. 
but the glowworm didn't answer it. So the centipede reached out of his hammock and picked up one of the boots from the floor. Put out that wretched light, he shouted, hurling the boot up towards the ceiling. The glowworm slowly opened one eye and stared at the centipede. There's no need to be rude, she said coldly, all in good time. Come on, come on, come on, shouted the centipede, or I'll put it out for you. Oh, hello, James, the glowworm said, looking at and giving James a little wave and a smile. I didn't see you come in. Welcome, my dear boy, welcome, and good night. Then click, and out the light went. James Henry Trotter lay in the darkness with his eyes wide open, listening to the strange sleeping noises of the creatures who were making all around him and wondering what on earth was going to happen to him in the morning. Already, he was beginning to like his new friends very much. They were not terribly, nearly as terrible as they looked. In fact, weren't really terrible at all. They seemed extremely kind and helpful in spite of all the shouting and arguing that went on between them. Good night, old green grasshopper, he whispered. Good night, ladybug. Good night, Miss Spider. But before he could go through them all, he had fallen fast asleep. We're off, someone was shouting. We're off, at last. James woke up with a jump and looked about him. He, The creatures were all out of their hammocks and moving silently around the room. Suddenly, the floor gave a great heave and though an earthquake was taking place, here we go, shouted the old green grasshopper hopping down with excitement. Hold on tight. What's happening, cried James, leaping out of his hammock. What's going on? The ladybug, who was obviously a kind and gentle creature, came over and stood beside him. In case you don't know, in case you don't know it, we're about to depart forever from the top of this ghastly hill we've all been living on for so long. We're about to roll away inside the great big beautiful peach to a land of 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 to a land of of what? asked James. Never you mind, said the ladybug, but nothing could be worse than this desolate hilltop and those two repulsive aunts of yours. Here, here, they all shouted. Here, here. You may not have noticed it, the ladybug went on, but the whole garden, even before it reaches the steep edge of the hill, happens to be on a steep slope, and therefore the only thing that has been stopping this peach from rolling away right from the beginning is a thick stem attached to the tree. Break the stem and off we go. Watch it, cried Miss Spider as the room gave another violent lurch. Here we go. Not quite, not quite. At this moment, continued the ladybug, our centipede, who has a pair of jaws as sharp as razors, is up there at the top of the peach, nibbling away at the stem. In fact, he must be nearly through it. As you can tell from the way he's lurching about, would you like me to, to take you under my wing so that you won't fall when we start rolling? That's very kind of you, said James, but I think I'll be all right. Just then the centipede stuck his grinning face through the whole ceiling and shouted, I've done it, we're off, we're off, the others cried, we're off. The journey begins, shouted the centipede, and who knows where it will end, muttered the earthworm. If you have anything to do with it, it can only mean trouble. Nonsense, said the ladybug. We're, we're now about to visit the most marvelous places and see the most wonderful things. Isn't that so, centipede? There's no knowing what we shall see, cried the centipede. We may see a creature with 49 heads who lives in the desolate snow, and wherever, whenever he catches a cold, which he dreads, he has 49 noses to blow. We may see the venomous pink spotted scratch who can chew up a man with one bite. It looks, it likes to eat five of them roasted for lunch and 18 for a supper at night. We may see a dragon and nobody knows that we won't see a unicorn there. We may be, we may see a terrible monster with toes growing out of its tufts of hair. We may see a sweet little bitty bright hen, so playful, so kind, so and well bred and such beautiful eggs. You just boil them and then they explode and they blow off your head. A new and a, a nosaurus, surely you'll see, and that ginormous and normal gnat whose sting when it stings you go you goes in at the knee and comes out through the top of your hat. We may even get lost and be frozen by frost. We may die in the earthquake or tremor. And nastier still we may be tossed on the horns of a furious dilemma. But who cares? Let us go from this horrible hill, let us roll, let us bowl, let us plunge. Let us rolling and bowling and spinning until we're away from this old spiker and sponge. One second later, slowly, insidiously, almost gently, the, the great peach started to lean forward and steal into motion. The whole room began to tilt over and all the furniture went sliding across the floor and crashed against the far wall. So did James and the ladybug and the old green grasshopper and Miss Spider and the earthworm and also the centipede who had just come slithering quickly down the hall wall. Outside the green in the garden at the very moment, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker had just taken their places at the front gate, each with a bunch of tickets in their hands, and the first stream of early morning sightseers was visible from the distance climbing up the hill to view the peach. 
We shall make a fortune today, Aunt Spiker was saying. Just look at all those people. I wonder what became of that horrid little boy of ours last night, Aunt Sponge said. He never did come back, did he? We probably fell down into the dark and broke his leg, Aunt Spiker said. Or his neck, maybe, Aunt Sponge said, hopefully. Just wait till I get my hands on him, Aunt Spiker said, waving her cane. He'll never want to stay out all night again. And by the time I've finished with him, good gracious me, what's that awful noise? Both women swung around to look. The noise, of course, had been caused by the great peach crashing through the fence and the surra that surrounded it and now gathering speed every second. It came rolling across the garden toward the place where Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker were standing. They gaped. They screamed. They started to run. They panicked. They got both got in each other's way and they began pushing and jostling and each of them was thinking about only saving herself. Aunt Sponge, the fat one, tipped over over a box that she brought along to keep money in and fell flat on her face. Aunt Spiker immediately tripped over the sponge and came down on top of her. They both lay on the ground, fighting and crawling and yelling and struggling frantically to get back up again. But before they could do this, the mighty peach was upon them. There was a crunch and then there was silence. The peach rolled on and behind it, Aunt Spiker, Aunt Sponge and Aunt Spiker lay, iron, lay ironed out upon the grass as flat and thin and lifeless as a couple of paper dolls cut out of the picture book. And now when the peach had broken out of the garden, it was over the edge of the hill, rolling and bouncing on the steep slope at a terrific pace. Faster and faster and faster it went, and the crowds of people who were climbing up the hill suddenly caught sight of this terrible monster plunging down upon them, and they screamed and scattered to right and left as it went hurtling by. At the top, bottom of the hill, it charged across the road, knocking over the telegraph pole and flattening two parked automobiles as it went by. When it rushed madly across the 20 fields, breaking down all of the fences and hedges in its path, it went right through the middle of the herd of fine Jersey cows, and then through a flock of sheep, and then through a paddock full of horses, and then through a yard full of pigs, and soon the whole countryside was seeding mass of panic-stricken animals stampeding in all directions. The peach was going to be a tremendous going at tremendous speed with this with a sign of with no sign of slowing down about a mile further on it came to a village down the main street of the village it rolled with people leaping frantically out of the path right and left and at the end of the street it went crashing right through the wall into an enormous building out on the other side leaving two gaping round holes in, in the brickwork the building happened to be famous a famous factory where they had made chocolate and almost at once a great river of warm melted chocolate came pouring out of the holes of the factory wall. A minute later, this brown sticky mess was flowing through every street of the village, oozing under the doors and houses into people's shops and gardens. Children were wading in it up to their knees, and some were even trying to swim in it, and all of them were sucking it into their mouths in greedy gulps and shrieking with joy. But the peach rushed on across the countryside and on and on, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. Cowshed, stables, pig sties, barns, bungalows, hay, hay ricks, anything that got in its way went toppling over like a nine pin. An old man sitting quietly beside a, a stream had his fishing rod whisked out of his hands as it went by and an old woman called Daisy and Whistle was standing so close to it as it passed that she had a, the skin taking off the tip of her long nose. Would it ever stop? Why should it? A round object will always keep rolling as long as it's on a downhill slope. And in this case, the land sloped downhill all the way until it reached the ocean. The same ocean that jo James had begged his aunts to be allowed to be visit one day. Well, perhaps he was going to visit it now. The peach was rushing closer and closer to it every second. The closer the towering white cliffs that came first. The cliffs are the most famous in the whole of England and they are hundreds of feet high. Below them, the sea is deep and cold and hungry. Many ships have been swallowed up and lost forever on this part of the coast, and all the men who were in them as well. The peach was now only a hundred yards away from the cliff, now fifty, now twenty, now ten, now five, and when it reached the edge of the cliff, it seemed to leap up to the sky, hang there suspended for a few seconds, still turning over and over in the air, then it began to fall down, 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 smack. It hit the water with a colossal splash and sank like a stone, but for a few seconds up it came, and this time up it stayed floating serenely upon the surface of the water. At this moment, the scene inside the peach itself was one of the most incredible, indescribable chaos. James Henry Trotter was lying bruised and battered on the floor of the room amongst the tangled mess of centipede and earthworm and spider and ladybug and glowworm and old green grasshopper. In the whole history of the world, no travelers had ever had more terrible journey than the, these unfortunate creatures. It had started out well with much laughing and shouting, and for the first few seconds, as the peach had begun to roll 
roll slowly forward. Nobody had minded being tumbled about a bit. And when it went bump, the centipedes had shouted, that was on Sponge, and uh, then bump again, and that was on Spiker. There had been tremendous bursts of cheer all around. But as soon as the peach rolled out of the garden and began to go down the steep hill, rushing, plunging, bounding badly down, downward, then the whole thing became a nightmare. James found himself being flung up against the ceiling and back onto the floor and then sideways against the wall, then up onto the ceiling and up and down and back and forth and round and round. And at the same time, all of the other creatures were flying through the air in every direction. And so were the chairs on the sofa, not to mention 42 boots belonging to a centipede. Everything all around them were being rattled around like peas inside an enormous rattle that had, was being rattled by a mad giant who refused to stop. Take, to make it worse, something went, on, went wrong with the glowworm's light system, and the room was, pitched, was in pitchy darkness. There were screams and yells and curses and cries of pain and everything that kept going round and round, and, and once James made a frantic grab at some, some thick bars sticking out from the wall, only to find out that there were a couple of centipedes' legs. Let go, you idiot, shouted Sandaby, kicking him free, and James was promptly flung across the room into the old grasshopper's horny lap. Twice he got tangled up in Miss Spider's legs, a horrid business, and toward the end, the poor earthworm, who was cracking himself like a whip every time he knew he flew through the air from one side of the room to the other, coiled himself around James's body in a panic and refused to unwind. Oh, it was a frantic and terrible trip, but it was all over now, and the room was suddenly very still and quiet. Everybody was beginning, beginning slowly and painfully to disentangle himself from everybody else. Let's have some light, shouted the centipede. Yes, they cried, light, give us some light. I'm trying, answered the poor glowworm. I'm doing my best, please be patient. And they all waited in silence. Then a faint greenish light became, began to simmer, glimmer out of the glowworm's tail and this gradually became stronger and stronger until it was, it was any way enough to see by. Some great journey, Centipede said, limping across the room. I shall never be the same again, murmured the earthworm. Nor I, the ladybug said, and it's taking years off my life. But my dear friends, cried the old green grasshopper, trying to be cheerful, we are there. Where, they asked, where is there? I don't know, the old green grasshopper said, but I'll bet it's somewhere good. We are probably at the bottom of a coal mine, said the earthworm gloomily. We certainly went down and down and down, very suddenly at the last moment. I felt it in my stomach. I still feel it. Perhaps we're in the middle of a beautiful country full of songs and music, the old green grasshopper said, or near the seashore, said James eagerly, with lots of other children down on the sand for me to play with. Pardon me, murmured the ladybug, turning a trifle pale, but I am not wrong in thinking that we seem to be bobbing up and down. Bobbing up and down, they cried. What on earth do you mean? You're still giddy from the journey, the old green grasshopper told her. You'll get over it in a minute. Is everybody ready to go upstairs now and take a look around? Yes, yes, they chorused. Come on, let's go. I refuse to show out, show myself out, out of the doors in my bare feet, said the centipede. I have to get my boots on again first. For heaven's sake, it's not enough to go through all that nonsense again, the earthworm said. Let's all lend the centipede a hand and get it over with, the ladybug said. Come on. So they did, all except Miss Spider, who set, who set about weaving a long rope ladder that would reach from the floor to the hole in the ceiling. The old green grasshopper had wisely said that they must not risk going out of, of the side entrance they didn't know where they were but must but must first all go up to the top of the peach town to look around so half an hour later when the rope ladder had been finished and hung the 42nd boot had been laced neatly into the centipede's 42nd foot they were all ready to go out amidst mounting excitement and shouts of here we go boys promised land can't wait to see it the whole company climbed up the ladder and one by one disappeared into the dark sulky tunnel in the ceiling that went steeply almost vertically up upwards a minute later, they were out in the open, standing on the very top of the peach near the stem, blinking their eyes in the strong sunlight, peering nervously around. What happened? Where are we? But this is impossible. Unbelievable. Terrible. I told you we were bobbing up and down, the ladybug said. We're in the middle of the sea, cried James. Indeed, they were. A strong current and a high wind had carried the peach so quickly away from the shore that already the land was out of sight. All around them lay the vast black ocean, deep and hungry. Little waves were bibbing against the sides of the peach. And how did it happen? Where are the fields? Where are the woods? Where is England? Nobody, not even James could understand how the world, how in the world a thing like this could even happen. Ladies and gentlemen, the old green grasshopper said, trying to very hard to keep the fear and disappointment out of his voice, I'm afraid that we find ourselves in a rather awkward situation. Awkward, cried the earthworm. My dear old grasshopper, we are finished. Every one of us is about to perish. I may be blind, you know, but that much I can see quite clearly. 
I'll flip my boots, shouted the centipede. I cannot swim in my boots at all. I can't swim at all, cried the ladybug. Nor can I, wailed the blue worm. Nor I, said Miss Spider. None of us three girls can swim a single stroke. But you won't have to swim, said James calmly. We are floating beautifully. And sooner or later, a ship is bound to come along and pick us up. They all stared at him in amazement. Are you quite sure that we are not sinking? The ladybug asked. Of course I'm sure. Go and look for yourselves. They all ran over to the side of the peach and peering down in the water. The boy's quite right, the old green grasshopper said. We are floating beautifully. Now we must all sit and wait perfect and keep perfectly calm. Everything will be all right in the end. What about nonsense? What absolute nonsense, cried the earthworm. Nothing is all is ever all right in the end, and you well know it. Poor earthworm, the ladybug said, whispering to James's ear. He loves to make everything into a disaster. He hates to be happy. He is only happy when he is gloomy. Now, isn't that odd? But then, I suppose, just being an earthworm is enough to make any person pretty gloomy. Don't you agree? If this peach is not going to sink, the earthworm was saying, and if we are not going to be drowned, then every one of us is going to starve to death instead. Don't you realize that we haven't a thing to eat since yesterday? Be by golly, he's right, cried Centipede. For once, the earthworm is right. Of course I'm right, said the earthworm, and we're not likely to find anything around here either. We shall get thinner and thinner and thirstier and thirstier, and we shall all die slowly and grisly death from starvation. I am dying already. I'm slowly shriveling up for want of food. Personally, I would rather drown. But good heavens, you must be blind, said James. You know very well I'm blind, said the earthworm. There's no need to rub it in. I didn't mean that, I'm sorry. But can't you see that? See, shouted the poor earthworm. How can I see if I'm blind? James took a deep breath. <sighs> Can't you realize, he asked patiently, that we have enough food here to last us for weeks and weeks? Where? They said, where? Why, the peach, of course. Our whole ship is made of food. Jumping Jehoshaphat, he, they cried. We never thought of that. My dear James, said the old green grasshopper, laying his front leg affectionately on James's shoulder. I don't know what we do without you. You are so clever. Ladies and gentlemen, we are saved again. We are most certainly not, said the earthworm. You must be crazy. You can't eat the ship. It's the only thing keeping us up. We shall starve if we don't, said the centipede, and we shall drown if we do, cried the earthworm. Oh dear, oh dear, said the old green grasshopper. Now we're worse off than before. Couldn't we just eat a little bit of it, asked the spider. I am so dreadfully hungry. You can eat all you want, James answered. It would take us weeks and weeks to try to make any sort of dent in this enormous peach. I'm sure you can see that. Good heavens, he's right, cried the green grasshopper, clapping his hands. It would take weeks and weeks, of course it would. But let's not go making a lot of holes all over the deck. I think we'd better, we'd better simply scoop it out of the tunnel over there, and the, the one that we've just come up by. An excellent idea, said the ladybug. What are you looking so worried about, earthworm? The centipede asked. What's the problem? The problem is, the earthworm said, the problem is, well, the problem is that there's no problem. Everyone burst out laughing. Cheer up, earthworm. See, they said, come and eat, and all they went over to the tunnel entrance and began scooping out great chunks of juicy golden colored peach flesh. Oh, marvelous, said the centipede, stuffing it in his mouth. Delicious, said the old green grasshopper. Just fabulous, said the glowworm. Oh my, said the ladybug primly, what a heavenly taste. She looked up at James and she smiled, and James smiled back at her. They sat down on the deck together, both of them chewing away happily. You know, James, said the ladybug. Up until this moment, I have never in my life tasted anything except for those tiny little green flies that live in the rose bushes. They have perfectly delightful flavor, but this peach is even better. It, isn't it glorious? Miss Spider said, coming over to join them. Personally, I had always thought of that a big juicy caught in the web bought blue bottle was the finest dinner in the world until I tasted this. What a flavor, the centipede cried. It's terrific. There's nothing like it. There never has been. And I should know because I personally have tasted the finest foods in the world. Whereupon the centipede, with his mouth full of peach with juice running down all of his chin, suddenly burst into song. I've eaten many strange and scrumptious dishes in my time, like jelly gnats and dandy prats and earwigs cooked in slime. The mice with rice, they're really nice when roasted in their prime. But don't forget to sprinkle them with just a pinch of grime. I've eaten fresh mud burgers by the greatest cooks there are, and scrambles, dregs, and stink bugs, eggs, and hornets stewed in tar. And pails of snails and lizard tails and beetles in a jar, a beetle is improved by just a splash of vinegar. Often, I often eat boiled slobbages, they're grand when served beside, minced doodle bugs and curried slugs, and have you ever tried? Mosquitoes, toes, and wampish rose, most delightfully fried. The only trouble is they disagree with my inside. 
I'm mad for crispy wasp wings on a piece of buttered toast, a pickle spines of porcupines, and then a gorgeous roast of dragon's flesh well hung, not fresh. It costs a bucket at the most, and most of you in barrels if you order it by, and mo and it comes to you in barrels if you order it by post. I crave the tasty tentacles of oct octopi for tea. I like hot dogs. I love hot frogs, and surely you'll agree. A plate of soil with engine's oil, a super recipe. I hardly need to mention that it's practically free. For dinner on my birthday, shall I tell you what I chose? Hot noodles made from poodles on a slice of garden hose. And a rather smelly jelly made of armadillo's toes. The jelly is delicious, but you have to hold your nose. Now comes, the centipede declared, the burden of my speech. These foods are rare and beyond compare. Some are right out of reach. But there's no doubt I'd go without a million plates of each for one small mite, one, sm one tiny bite of this fantastic peach. Everybody was feeling happy now. The sun was shining brightly out of the soft blue sky and the day was calm. The giant peach with the sunlight glinting on its side was like a massive golden ball sailing upon a silver sea. Look, cried the centipede just as they were finishing their meal. Look at the funny thin black thing gliding in the water over there. All of us, all, they all swung around to look. There are two of them, said the spider. There are lots of them, said the ladybug. What are they, asked the earthworm, getting worried. They must be some kind of fish, said the old green grasshopper. Perhaps they have come along to say hello. They are sharks, cried the earthworm. I'll bet you anything they, they, they are sharks and they have come along to eat us up. What absolute rot, the centipede said, but his voice seemed suddenly to have become a little shaky and he wasn't laughing. I am positive they are sharks, said the earthworm. I just know they are sharks. And so, in an actual fact, did everybody else, but they were too frightened to admit it. There was a short silence. They were peered down anxiously at the sharks who were cruising slowly around and around the peach. Just assuming that they are sharks, the centipede said, they, are, they still can't possibly be any danger if we stay up here. But even as he spoke, one of them, one of those thin black fins suddenly changed directions and came cutting swiftly through the water right up to the side of the peach itself. The shark paused and stared at the company with small evil eyes. Go away, they shouted. Go away, you filthy beast. Slowly, almost lazily, the shark opened its mouth, which was big enough to have swallowed a perambulator and made a lunge at the peach. They all watched aghast, and now, as though a signal from the leader, all of their sharks came swimming around the peach and they clustered around it and began to attack it furiously. They must have been 20 or 30 of them at least, all pushing and fighting and lashing their tails and churning the water into a froth. Panic and pandemonium broke out immediately on top of the peach. Oh, we are finished now, cried Miss Spider, wringing her feet. They will eat up the whole peach and there will be nothing left for us to stand on and they will start on us. She is right, shouted the ladybug. We are lost forever. Oh, I don't want to be eaten, wailed the earthworm, but they will make take me first of all because I am so fat and juicy and I have no bones. Is there nothing we can do? Asked the ladybug, appealing to James. Surely you can think of a way out of this. Suddenly, they were all looking at James. Think, begged Miss Spider. Think, James, think. Come on, said the centipede. Come on, James. There must be something we can do. Their eyes waited upon him, tense, anxious, pathetically hopeful. There is something that I believe we can, might try, James Trotter said slowly. I'm not saying it'll work. Tell us, cried the earthworm. Tell us quick. We'll try anything you say, said the centipede. But hurry, hurry, hurry. Be quiet and let us the boy speak. Go on, James. They all moved a little closer. There was a longish pause. Go on, cried frantically, frantically, go on. And all of the time they were all waiting, they could hear the sharks threshing around the water below them. It was enough to make anyone frantic. Come on, James, said the ladybug, coaxing him. I, I, I'm afraid it's no good after all, James murmured, shaking his head. I'm terribly sorry, I forgot. We don't have a string. We need hundreds of yards of string to make this work. What sort of string, said the old grasshopper sharply? Any sort, just so it's long and strong. But my dear boy, that's exactly what we do have. We've got all you want. How, where? The silkworm, cried the old green grasshopper. Didn't you notice the silkworm? She's, she's still downstairs. She never moves, but she still lies there sleeping all day, but we can easily wake her up and make her spin. And what about me, may I ask, Miss Spider? I can spin just as well as any silkworm. What's more, I can spin patterns. Can you make a long, make enough between you? Asked James, as much as you want. And quickly, of course, of course. And it wouldn't be strong, the strongest there is and the thickest your finger, but why? What are you going to do? I'm going to lift the peach clear out of the water, James said firmly, you're mad. It's all our only chance. The boy is crazy, he's joking. Come on, James, the ladybug said gently. How are you going to do it? Sky hooks, I suppose, jeered the centipede. Seagulls, James answered calmly. The place is full of them, look up there. 
They all looked and saw a great mass of seagulls wheeling around around the sky. I'm going to take a long silk string and I'm going to loop it on one of the ends of the seagull's necks and then I'm going to tie the other end of the stem to the peach. And then he pointed to the peach's stem, which was standing up short, thick mast in the middle of the deck. Then I'm going to get another seagull to do the same thing and another and another. Ridiculous, I shouted. Absurd, poppycock, balderdash, badness. And then the old green grasshopper said, how can a few seagulls lift an enormous thing like this and up in the air and all of us as well? It would take hundreds and thousands. There is no shortage of seagulls, James said. Look for yourself. We'll probably need 400, 500, 600, even maybe a thousand. I don't know. I shall simply go on hooking them until the, to the stem until we have enough to lift us. They'll bound us to lift they'll bound to be lift us to the end and it's the balloons you give someone enough balloons to hold and i mean really enough then up he goes and the seagull is far more lifting power than a balloon if only they have time to do it you're absolutely off your head said the earthworm how on earth could you suppose to get a loop of string on the seagull's neck i suppose you're gonna fly up there yourself and catch it the boy's daughter let him finish said the ladybug go on james how would you do it with bait bait with what sort of bait with a worm, of course. Seagulls love worms. Didn't you know that? And luckily for us, we have the biggest, fattest, pinkest, juiciest earthworm in the world. You can stop right there, the earthworm said sharply. That's quite enough. Go on, the other said, beginning to grow interested. Go on. The seagulls have already spotted him, said James continued. And that's why there's so many of them circling around us. But they daren't come down to get him while the rest of us are standing there. So this is what... Stop, cried the earthworm. Stop, stop, stop. I don't have... I won't have it. I refuse. I... 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 Be quiet, said the centipede. Mind your own business. I like that. My dear earthworm, you're going to be eaten away. So what difference does it make whether this, it's sharks or seagulls? I won't do it. Why don't we hear what the plan is first? The old green grasshopper said the old green grasshopper. I don't ha give a hoot what the plan is, cried the earthworm. I am not going to be pecked to death by a bunch of seagulls. You won't be a, you will be a martyr, said the centipede. I shall respect you for the rest of my life. So will I, said Miss Spider, and your name will be in all the newspapers. Earthworm gives life to save friends, but he won't have to give his life. James told him, now listen to me, this is what we'll do. And that is part two of James and the Giant Peach. Now we're gonna get into our discussion questions and activity. All right, friends, so here's your discussion questions. Number one, how would you compare and contrast the way the seven friends treated James as opposed to the way the two aunts treated James? What are the differences and are there any similarities? Okay, so remember, write your answers in the comments below. Again, question number one, how would you compare and contrast the way the seven friends treated James as opposed to the way the aunts treated James? And are there any differences or similarities? Question number two, how do you imagine what happened when the stem of the giant peach snapped? Would it look different if you were standing on the outside of the garden? So how do you imagine the action of the peach when it, the stem snapped and it started to roll? What do you picture? What did it look like to you? Okay, which brings us to our activity. So our activity is I want you to make a picture of one of the scenes described in the chapters. Be sure to include a large peach in the picture, okay? So once you do that, I want you to cut a hole or cut around the peach itself that you draw, and then you can tape your picture to another piece of paper, and then you're gonna have your peach open like a door. So this is what I mean. So you're gonna draw a picture of one of the scenes. This is where the peach is going down the hill and people are running away from it, okay? Then you're gonna cut around your peach, but you're gonna leave one part of it or ever on your picture um, connected and then you'll tape a blank piece of paper to the back of your picture. From here, you'll be able to open your peach open like a door. And then I want you to draw what you picture happening on the inside of the peach during this scene. So there's almost two scenes in one. What it looks like from the outside and what it looks like from the inside. Okay, so you gotta think of one scene two different ways. So, make your peach, cut your door, open it up, and show the scene from inside. Once you're done, go ahead and take a picture of your project. Um, you can even take a video, send it to me, tell me what's going on in your picture, what's going on in the story, um, and then put your pictures and videos in the comments below, okay? Thank you so much for joining us for our second part of James and the Giant Peach for our Girl Scouts Virtual Book Club. 
Um, you guys are doing amazing, amazing work, and I truly love seeing all of you tuning in every single week. Um, so until next week, bye guys.